Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our brief little anatomy lecture to give you an idea of what to look forward to when you join us here at OSU this upcoming fall. I'm Dr. Melissa Quinn. I'm an assistant professor uh, clinical over in the Department of Biomedical Education of an and Anatomy. And I basically teach a lot of the anatomy in your first part of the curriculum, myself and my colleague, Dr. McHugh. And then I will be part of your journey also in part two and a little bit in part three. So you'll be getting to know me pretty well and I'm very excited to get to know all of you. So if you want, we're gonna take some time and kind of talk about the heart and see some of these awesome features. And then I'm gonna have some students show you what we can use over here in the Sim Center to really apply the anatomy to some of the clinical pieces that you're gonna see. Briefly, before I do get going into this lecture, I do wanna make it known that I will be showing some cadaveric images. So be aware that those will be showing up here. Uh, we here at OSU do have a memorial service and you will be involved in that as you come and work with your donors. So let's get going. One of the things I like to do first in all of my lectures with you is talk about how does this apply clinically to what you're gonna be looking at. And anatomy is that basic foundation of all clinical sciences. So really when we talk about the heart, our first case that we have here is really breaking it down of when you have a patient, what are those diagnoses that they're coming in with? And as you read through that case, really the main gist of what this lecture is getting at is do we understand what the basic anatomy is of the heart? What are those different heart valves? And where can we actually listen to them on the body? So the first thing with that case is understanding where is the heart situated in the body when you look at it. So when you look for the heart, you're gonna see that it's situated basically from that second intercostal space, which means that space between rib two and rib three, all right? And what we're gonna see is that's considered the base of the heart. And that heart's gonna be basically with its apex down into about that fifth intercostal space where it points over to your left hip. So it's nicely situated where it's not directly on midline. Notice on this slide, on this cartoon image, it's actually about two thirds positioned over to the right or left side of the body. While we're looking over on the, the right side with about one third. So when we look at the actual dissection, we take the rib cage off, we could see the position of the heart and some of the vessels that are gonna be draining blood into the heart itself. Notice how the two lungs are flanking the uh, heart right in the middle, but also look at that heart. It's encased within its pericardium. So we are still within this fibrous sheath before we open up the tissue and actually see the heart muscle itself. And when we talk about the heart, you're gonna do a lot with imaging and other courses as you're here at OSU. But what we want to understand is the basic organization of it just grossly when you go to dissect it in the lab. So just like anything, the heart is going to have borders, it's going to have surfaces as you look at it. In the heart, what's interesting about it, it's not like that classic heart that you think of for Valentine's Day, right? It's almost in the shape of an inverted pyramid where you have that pyramid and you push it down onto one of its sides so that the base of that pyramid is actually positioned more posteriorly. And then you have the borders moving forward in an anterior direction to go towards the apex. So the apex of the heart is the more inferior portion when you look at it. There's obviously going to be a right border and a left border associated with the heart, and those are positioned close to the lungs. There's also going to be a superior border, and that superior border is going to be where we find our great vessels coming out of the heart. So we're gonna see the superior vena cava, we're gonna see the aorta with its branches, as well as something known as the pulmonary trunk to go over to the lungs. We also are going to see associated with the heart a surface that sits on the diaphragm. So that's its inferior surface or its diaphragmatic surface. So think about when you're breathing, every time you breathe, your diaphragm drops a little, so does your heart. So it's a very dynamic structure that we think very statically, but really it's very mobile, it's moving. So we want to be aware of these surfaces and these borders so that when you go and you look at, let's say a chest X-ray, or you're looking at ultrasound, you can understand where you're at anatomically to think about what border am I looking at? What vessel is coming in on that right side of the heart? 
Now, if we go and we think about that, once we have our borders and we're dissecting the heart out and we take it out in situ without even cutting into it to see the chambers, you're gonna see there's a lot of external features associated with it. And one thing every student asks me, and you can ask our students that are gonna be here with us today, is how do I know what's anterior, what's posterior? And that's gonna be our job as we continue through our whole journey throughout anatomy. And one thing that we're gonna see, especially on these hearts right here, is that associated with the right side, that's all predominantly chambers that are gonna be receiving deoxygenated blood. So on your slide, notice how that top part of the heart has a little sort of dog-eared structure. That's known as the oracle, and that's indicative of what's known as an atrium. And that right atrium's receiving deoxygenated blood from the rest of the body and the heart itself. And as you move inferiorly, that muscular chamber below that atrium, that is your right ventricle. And that ventricle is gonna be able to pump blood out to the lungs, basically getting rid of that deoxygenated blood so that we could pick up oxygen. And then that oxygenated blood is gonna come into the left vent or atrium. And when we look at that image, look at the posterior view. There's four vessels coming into a chamber and that's indicative of our left atrium, receiving oxygenated blood from the lungs. And at this point, if we move inferior from that left atrium, we go into the left ventricle. And this is a very thick chamber because let's think about it. It has to pump blood out to the entire body, basically from your thorax all the way down to your big toe or all the way up to your brain. So it has to have a very nice thick muscle associated with it. Now, we also are looking at this image and saying, okay, there's some fat really deposited on the heart. And that is a healthy amount of fat because within that fatty pad will be the vessels that actually supply the heart. So you'll see on here, there's something called the coronary sulcus. And within that sulcus, we'll find the coronary vessels that come off of the base of the aorta. And it's gonna crown around the top of the heart and give off the vas vasculature that supplies it. Also look, everyone loves to see the aorta. So you see the aorta coming out and arching and then giving off its three main trunks, the brachiocephalic, the first, the second, the right common carotid, uh, the left common carotid, and then the third, the left subclavian. So we see all these vessels and you're gonna be able to actually do that because here at OSU, we're gonna be working in the lab and taking out hearts so you could see those. When you cut into the heart though, you're gonna notice it's not just free reign for all blood flow. You have a unidirectional flow that actually occurs. And we'll talk about the embryo at some point in time as you come here. But we're gonna see that the heart is what we call septated. So it does have walls between chambers. So there will be a septum between the two atria. So there's an, what's known as an atrioventricular septum indicated in green on this slide. And then there is a septum between the two ventricles, that interventricular septum in gold. And you can see how that has a nice thick muscle and then Really, as you move superiorly, it's a membranous portion where we'll see there's a lot of what we call ventricular septal defects that can happen here because of development. And then we also notice there are valves. So as blood's moving in these chambers, these valves are there to really deal with pressure changes and open and close, which are gonna create the heart sounds that we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. So we will have valves between the atrium ventricles, and those are atrioventricular valves, both are right and the left. And then there are valves between the ventricles and their ejecting vessels, which are the aorta or the pulmonary trunk. So we have pulmonary semilunar valves and aortic, so that blood is moving in a unidirectional flow. And if we have any issue with those valves and you get regurgitation, that is where you start to hear differences in the actual movement of blood in turbulence. So if you cut open and we follow our journey through the heart, you're gonna see different features associated with each of the chambers. I'm not gonna go through all of them today. I want you to come here so that we could go in lots of detail with that when you come in August. So when we look at the right atrium, there will be very distinct features. And one of those distinct features I want you to just see on here is something known as fossa ovalis, all right? It's that little thumbprint in that atrioventricular septum. And that is actually an embryological remnant of a shunt that we had when we were developing, where blood would flow between the two chambers. And we actually see some of that in the lab itself. So there will be very distinguishing features associated with the atria. And if you don't believe me from a cartoon image, it really does look like that when you cut open the heart. So you could see the very distinct 
um, the pectinate muscle on the wall, you could see the smooth muscle. And although you might not see it too well in this image, there is nice little thumbprint indicative of that fossa ovalis. Now moving from that atrioventricular um, uh, atrium, we're gonna go down through a, a valve, all right? And these valves, again, are allowing for that unidirectional flow. And the first of these is the right atrioventricular valve. All right, it's also known as the tricuspid valve because it has three cusps associated with it. So we're seeing that this atrioventricular valve is really going to allow blood to move down that chamber. And from there you go into the right ventricle. And again, very distinct features are in this ventricle. One of the, my favorite regions of the heart to open is actually the right ventricle. And you'll see there are muscles on the wall and muscles that come off the floor, those papillary muscles with their chordae tendineae, which we call heart strings that go into the valve cusps to help with opening and closing. And it does look like that. It's a beautiful structure when you open up that right ventricle. And you'll be able to see this all and hold that in your hand. And then from there, you move out through another valve. And this is one of the semilunar valves. All right, so you can see your pulmonary semilunar valve moving blood out into the pulmonary trunk right here. It's more anterior on this image. And then you go from the lungs into the left atrium. So now you're gonna see the left atrium has very distinct features as well, but not as many as the right atrium, all right? And you could see that in a dissection where it's a very smooth walled portion, but you see the pulmonary vessels coming in in depositing that oxygenated blood on its path to go out to the rest of the body. From here, you have to go through another valve because remember, we have lots of doors here. And the valve that we go through here is the left atrioventricular. It looks a little bit different than the right because there are two main cusps. So this is known as your bicuspid or your mitral valve. So this is where we're gonna move blood from that left atrium down into the left ventricle to allow for that unidirectional flow. And what we're gonna see with the left ventricle, guess what, very similar to the right. So in this left side, however, you're gonna notice that the wall of that heart is much thicker. And like we said previously, that's because we have to have a lot of force to move out to the rest of the body. So that left ventricle is also gonna have papillary muscles and those chordae tendineae that go up onto the, the inferior surface of those valve cusps. So we can see it's a very distinct organization right here as we look into the left uh, ventricle itself. So let's think, where are we gonna go next? We have to go out through a valve, of course. So from here, we're gonna be able to see um, our dissection where we cut and you can see the two very large papillary muscles. So if we are our oxygenated blood, we wanna go out to the rest of the body. So the ventricle is gonna start to pump and as it pumps, it pushes that blood out through your aortic semilunar valve so that you can move blood out into the aorta. And from here, when we look at our image, go and find, <clears throat> excuse me, the pulmonary semilunar valve. Go right behind that and you'll see the aortic semilunar valve. And this is the valve that we're able to go out into the aorta, one of the thickest, largest uh, vessels in the entire body. And you can ask Alex or Aaron, who are gonna be here with us today, that is a very significant structure and it's one of those wow factors when you see the aorta. So what we see is that blood is moving from those atria through the AV valves, down into the ventricles, and then out through the semilunar valves in this nice flow pattern. And what you're gonna see is that, in general, when you move blood through these valves, there's not really any leakage that occurs. So you shouldn't hear any sort of movement through the valve itself, any what we call murmurs. However, valves can be leaky, they can become disruptive, and if that happens, you're gonna hear rumbling or murmurs that can occur. So what you do, and you will be doing lots of practice with this, is go through different auscultation points or points for you to be able to find on the body to listen to the um, heart valves themselves. So there are different auscultation points and these points are going to allow you to listen to each of the heart valves. So when we look at our slide right here, you can see there is the surface projection and what you do is you go downstream of blood flow in order to listen to each of these valves. And our students here today are going to use one of our mannequins here in the sim lab to show you where you would listen to those heart valves. 
So for right now, let's just listen to what a normal uh, blood flow and listening to these heart sounds are gonna sound like. It's pretty interesting to hear that it's a dynamic flow that's occurring. So Dr. Quinn, what happens when something goes wrong? Well, that brings us back to our case. So in our case here, we're dealing with what's known as mitral valve prolapse. So the valve is moving back onto itself. So that means blood is going to move in the opposite direction, creating a murmur. So let's hear in general, what does that sound like? What's a mitral valve's prolapse? Notice the difference? So now what I want us to do is actually, <clears throat> excuse me, go over to the sim lab and look at one of the mannequins we have here and have the students demonstrate to you how they work in the lab with this anatomy to be able to auscultate these heart valves and hear the difference that occurs. All right, thank you, Aaron and Alex for coming. Now what we're going to do is listen on Harvey, one of the mannequins here at the Sim Lab, to listen to those heart sounds. Aaron's gonna move his uh, stethoscope while Alex and I are able to listen at the same time. So Aaron, go ahead and move around the auscultation points for normal heart sounds. Notice how Harvey's breathing and gives you that realistic opportunity here. Now let's go to our case. So we had mitral valve prolapse. Mm -hmm. Let's see how it sounds different in uh, turn to those normal. All right, Aaron, take us on. <laughs> yeah, right there. Right there, you hear the flow. Very cool. So you can see how that anatomy is tying in to our, our, our mannequin right here. So thank you both for joining us. Well, thank you all for joining us. I'm really glad that you had taken the time to be here, but I hope to see you in August here at OSU. So OH! <laughs>